If you've ever watched a special on Netflix or HBO or wherever, it's safe to say that that is years of that person's work. And more often than not, most of that work usually happens at an open mic. <laughs> The way it works is I, uh, I pull the names out the bucket uh, and uh, when the comedians have a minute left I'm going to be standing on the side there giving them a light uh, so this is also important for anyone who's performing for the first time you know some people uh, yeah they've never done it before and this is the place where they start so you guys are in for a treat or not you know there's no quality control this is also something I want to mention if you can write your name on a piece of paper uh, you qualify to perform at this show. So uh, just so you know, lower your expectations, and uh, we're all gonna have a great time. When I when I started comedy, the f the first time that I bombed, um, I was like, because it was like literally the first time that I was at an open mic, and I bombed, and I was like, this is th this is good, because like this means that there is actually work that needs to be put into this, and because comedy is this one thing that just involves everything, you know. Comedy is the literally the one form that has singing, acting, wordplay. Uh, you need to be somewhat of a poet here and there. You need to have a proper persona. You need to have a background of fucking things that you can talk about. And you need to be open-minded to see things from all points, you know, so that you can make something funny f for everyone or for a specific, you know. There's a lot of things that you can learn, and I was just really fascinated by this, like, off the bat. Instantly, my hand goes on, I'm thinking, boom, I'm like, this is yours, this is mine, do not cross the line. I pay for none of your shit, I don't want that type of money, bro. This is not gonna happen, I'm a barista. This, no, I'm not paying for none of your, keep it away, I'm not paying for none of your shit. Uh, I believe you can get to to such a point where necessarily, even if you don't find something to to be um, funny or in any way like humorous, you can make it humorous, you know, because you know the tools how to make things just a conversation humorous, you know, and that way you can touch upon things. And as they say, like the the medicine is always tastier when you put honey on it. To me, comedy can be you can be kind of medicine because you spit truth. But it's covered in laughter, you know, and it's fed and, pe and people afterwards are going to be like, that was so funny, but true. But essentially, if you're going on stage and doing a bunch of jokes that everyone's heard before, you are going to make like people laugh because a lot of people that have never really seen comedy that much before. Um, but it's like, I just feel like you're wasting people's time in a way. It's just like, just clear that stage, clear that space up for someone that really is wants to really make people uh, l laugh uh, about, like comedy is there to sort of heal people's pain. I think that's why it's around. And um, yeah, I don't know. I just, it's so brilliant when it's used as an art form. It's so fantastic. It really unites people. And um, when people are just fucking around and just going up there for their own ego because they like a lot of people, you know, they didn't get enough attention as a child and they want a lot of people to look at them and stuff like that. Um, I don't, I don't really know what I'm saying here, <laughs> but I just like, it's 
just strive to be an artist. Don't just piss about and waste everyone's time. That's fucking sick. If you have the skills for that, like, I want to learn, you know? Right now, I'm not, like, that good at all, you know, or anything. But it's like the possibility of me learning is there. So, like, fuck yes, let's do it, you know? Just being able to express yourself the way you want to express yourself and make people understand, you know, through laughter. That's fucking, that's magic. That's beautiful. It's, you, like your jokes, you know, like the Sri Lanka jokes, the the ones that you say, like how much uh, has been donated to Sri Lanka, how much has been donated to Notre Dame, you know, there, there's so much truth to that, but you word it in such a way that people are like, ah, ha, 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 ha. Notre Dame Cathedral for its restoration has raised over a billion dollars. And meanwhile, the Sri Lankan Red Cross has raised a few hundred thousand, which isn't nothing, but it just shows you what people's priorities are. You know, instead of possibly touching the lives of hundreds of children, they'd rather help restore a building where hundreds of children probably got touched. It's... <laughs> <laughs> oh, but it's... People got fucking murdered, you know? <laughs> it's gonna be your next act. <laughs> so thank you! My first set was at Cosmic Comedy that's run by someone who's now a very close friend, uh, Darmanda Singh. And I remember my first set going well. I, I mean, usually your perception of it is a little skewed because you're so nervous that it's almost a blackout. But I remember feeling good afterwards and then just wanted to replicate that feeling as many times as possible. Uh, something I did not succeed doing, to be fair. I was so terrible starting out. And I don't say that to be humble at all. There are witnesses with good memories to just how trash I was in the beginning. I remember when you started and you are like, hands down, one of the worst first timers I've ever seen in my life. But hard working, I can't yeah, yeah, you really hard. studied it. I remember, I remember just having a conversation about you when you started, and we were like, oof, that guy, ass. Can we give him three minutes? I think that's too long. Fuck, that's awful. Yeah, you kept going, man, you do your shit. Um, how did I start stand up? I was standing in Tier Park in Berlin, roughly around 2006, and I started talking. And the next thing I knew, a crowd gathered around me. A lady threw a hat down, and 20 minutes later, she gave me the hat, and there were 700 euros in there. And I was like, wait a minute, you even want to pay me to talk? Okay, I can do that. So I started comedy, I started like last year, November. So I guess it's about what a year. I actually started in Dusseldorf. I just did one set there. I convinced this dude that I'm a stand-up comedian. And he's like, how much time do you need on stage? And I was like, I don't know, like 20, 25 minutes should be fine. <laughs> I have no material. <laughs> I don't even know what material is at that point. I go to the place and it's like something that, that it, it was like a sold out, like a techno thing. And it was like in this huge hall. If I can, I walk in before the whole stuff and I'm just waiting to hear like Dio Katunga because I can't hear anything else. And he goes, Dio Katunga. And I had like a joke around the, the mic stand. And he says, like, because I see comedians just holding the mic stand all the time. And he goes, Dio Katunga. And I leave the fucking room and I go up on stage and I just see a fucking sea of people. <laughs> it's just like shit ton of people there for techno. Behind me is the DJ booth, right? And I grab them and he just goes, have fun, buddy, and hands me the microphone. There's no mic stand. <laughs> and uh, the first, like, whatever, like, two, three jokes that I had in my mind, I had to hold the mic stand. No mic stand. <laughs> so I'm like, oh shit. If I guess stood there for like 25 minutes, like, how much minutes do I got left? And the guy's like, one minute. And I was like, all right. Bye. <laughs> I just fucking left the stage. And I was like, shit, man, this is gonna be hard. Good. <laughs> you know, because <laughs> it, it makes sense. If it's hard and you work towards it and then actually it like starts working, I get like a lot of satisfaction from it. So I started skating too. Like I fell on my face and I was like, this is going to be hard. Good. You know, effort's going to make sense after a while. I, I talked, some comedians remembered my first uh, set because I was talking about how I wiped my grandmother's vagina after she had a surgery. So, yeah. Well, but I mean, that's kind of a bit awkward now. I mean, like, did you not expect me? 
so she had colon cancer and uh, and in Russia it's very difficult to get a hold of a nurse, of a doctor, you have to bribe everyone just like that. My mom was giving me money every day uh, when I was visiting my grandma in the hospitals. Like Lena just, yeah, some money for this person, some money for this person, for this person, you always have to do that. And uh, my grandmother, so there's not always a nurse next to a person. So I was sitting there and my grandmother had to use the bathroom. After that I had to uh, wipe her and I mean she was lying there literally like blood like she had this bags for blood you know dripping from her stomach still she had just had the surgery she she couldn't move so I was trying not to move her while I was wiping her so I was just reaching on the blanket like this like going doing something and she's a very fancy lady and she was going Lena what are you doing what are you doing I'm like what am I doing oh my god what am I doing am I doing something wrong she's like we are wiping from back to front I'm like, bitch, seriously? You just nearly died of cancer. You had people like you don't know who just removed a meter of your colon from your body and this is what you're concerned about. I always wipe back to front and look at me, I'm fine. What a wonderful world. <laughs> he didn't believe that. He was black in 1950. <laughs> <laughs> he was thinking somebody else's reality. <laughs> Sad, right? <laughs> Um, I've been in Germany for a while, man, since 2003, came over as a soldier, uh, went to Iraq a couple times, went crazy, you know, as most soldiers do, got married. Like two weeks before I went to Iraq the second time, I was like, yo, baby, I love you. I'm not sure if I'm going to make it back. You should be my wife. And you know, we got married, dog. <laughs> yo, never get married if you're about to go to war, dog. <laughs> It's the worst thing ever, dude. It's the worst thing ever. You stressed out from the war and you stress out like, oh man, I just got married. Went crazy again after the whole divorce situation. I was like, no, man, I gotta start doing comedy, dog. Cause that's where it's at, bro. Get on stage and tell jokes and you won't get paid, but you'll get some free drinks, you know what I mean? <laughs> man, it's three people up ahead, dude. If I bond, it won't even matter. Give me some of that smoke! <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I wanted to find a way to deal with my anxiety and I thought the only way to do that was to do everything that I thought and my anxiety was hindering me from doing. So I was afraid of public speaking. I was terrified of it. I always thought I, I, I could be a comedian or wanted to be a comedian. So I forced myself to do a set. And that felt terrible. That was like, okay, I'm... I'm not, I'm not gonna do this. Like the one reaction I got from the audience was like a middle of my set, it was just like an ugh. And it was like from the back of a 500 people audience, you know, so it's like, it doesn't even make sense that I heard that at a fair at night. I used the word fuck like close to a hundred times. <laughs> I think someone backstage was counting. They're like, dude, did you, say, did you say how many times you said fuck? I'm like, dude, I have no fucking idea. <laughs> I did uh, an open mic in London called The Car Crash, and really, like, yeah, it's a good good choice of name for that mic. I'm shaking, I'm shaking uncontrollably. It's not because I'm nervous, it's, uh, it's because my body's being supported by THC and caffeine. Uh, barely remember because I took so much uh, Ativan, like uh, lorazepam, like <laughs> anti-anxiety meds. You're supposed to take like one and I took I took like five that day um, so I just felt like I was like in a dream yeah and I had written out my whole uh, five minutes um, uh, I typed it out on the computer on one word and then printed it out and I glued it into a notebook so it looked like I wrote it by hand <laughs> so it was less formal but my handwriting is too bad so I actually had to type it out and glue it in and then I just sat on a stool Looked down and just read the whole thing five minutes straight. That's how bad my like stage fright was too. Tries brand new shit. <laughs> gets two applause breaks. Yeah. Gets greedy. Yeah. Does an old bit nothing. The show's late and it's fair. Uh, you are not that good, but you get some laughter and he's like, okay, I think for. For my level, I think I'm good. So I'm gonna keep improving, keep working. And that's how what's happened to me. 
like the first year I was really bad. But I remember people telling me like, oh, that was really good. That was a funny joke. But like they were laughing at the idea that was not done yet. Like I don't have any bit that I did in the first two years. I don't have it. Like I don't tell it as I told it two years ago. All these bits got better. All these bits uh, either died or they got better. So that's how, that's how you do it. I'm from Sri Lanka. I came to Berlin for a job. And you wouldn't expect m moving to Germany that there would be a flourishing English stand-up comedy scene. But Berlin in particular is such an international city. Uh, you get people in the scene from all over the place. And because of history, a lot of them grew up speaking English. Originally from New York City. I'm from Venezuela. From Uganda. I come from Lebanon. Romania. It's like, well, I'm, a guy. I'm originally from Canada. I'm half from Bulgaria, half from Congo. I'm from Syria. I was born in Dubai. Three, Palestine. I'm half Brazilian, half German. From Philadelphia. Colombia. Three, Palestine, baby. Oh, no, Berlin is just not. <laughs> it's just not real Germany. It's like, it's whatever, but it's not Germany. Uh, I mean, like the differences are so vast, I wouldn't even know where to begin. Like I live in Vedding, like the most common languages in Vedding are like, I would say like Arabic, Turkish, English, then like Russian and Polish and then German, you know, like uh, I don't think that Berlin even considers itself to be Germany. I think it's weird that they're still the capital of Germany because they so obviously don't want it, like they <laughs> seem to be annoyed by it. I think like a city like Hamburg or even Munich, like they seem to really want it and try it. Like, I think we should just do it. So uh, I need to prepare the Germans in the room. Uh, this is an English comedy show. And at an English comedy show in Berlin, we do a little thing called German bashing, okay? <laughs> it's just we make a little light fun of the German people because I, I'm sure you're into that Munich, yeah, all right. <laughs> you make fun of German people too by being more rich than the rest of them. I get it, all right. Like learning about Berlin before coming here, I realized, oh yeah, this place is a history of like, arts and uh, people experimenting and it's so cheap you can just try a lot of shit like that was sort of the spirit of Brooklyn in the early 2000s or of the Lower East Side or the village in the 90s it just felt like a continuation of that energy I think starting a scene involves just eating it for a long time I, I equate a lot with like a, you know just like I, I used to I used to play in a lot of punk rock bands and hardcore bands and when I was a kid and like um, I think I think there's something very similar to that just like the, the, the DIY spirit of, of just, you know, fucking just go for your shit, you know, and just do it your way, your thing. Like, there's no, just no infrastructure, it doesn't matter. You do it, you make that shit happen, you know? And uh, I'm not saying we were any successful at it, but like, I, I don't know, I kept doing it. My awareness of, of Europe as an English-speaking talent base was uh, blown away. But it was only two shows, I and I started a show as soon as I knew I was going to live here. And that was it. Or not a show, I started the open mic Sunday slip. of whatever can happen. It can be really great, it can be horrible. You can have like, ah, oh, <laughs> a lot of newbies, or you can have a whole bunch of professionals. I don't really, it's consistent because of the fact that we've been around for so long. And I think that the people who love, love us come back and they always spread the word. And it's a really hard room for learning, but it is, that's the purpose of it. It's a room where you can make these mistakes and nobody's gonna judge you. If anything, you're gonna get a positive critique within the negative aspects of it. We try not to censor people, and that's a bit hard with all the new you know, PC queer culture, which is great, I encourage all of it, but at the same time, I think that at this safe space, open mic, you should be able to tell that horrible joke that you hope you never hear on another stage again, and, um, and learn from it. Learn from that bombing, or learn from the applause. Yeah. It's a bit of a, I think most of the younger people in Berlin rather do other 
mics because they're more encouraging to just like, yay, you did it, you were on stage, good for you. And at Slips, we're like, time's up, <laughs> you suck. <laughs> uh, thank you, come back next week. And so I encourage you to go with the flow and enjoy this next piece. Put your hands together, please, for Chicago. We don't curate, so it's not like we know what we're gonna put you in between. So it's even hard for me as a host or Winton or Verity at the door, because sometimes we have energies that walk through that door that don't get along, and we've got to manage that throughout the night, worry about our audience, and also worry on our own material. But it's fun, it's a family. We are not going to lose Comedy Open Mic on a Tuesday over and over and over again. Here we go. It's a little bit debatable, but yeah, I think we are. I think we're the longest consistently running <laughs> at the same venue. Yeah, we've been at the same venue for eight years, every Tuesday, except during Christmas and summer breaks. Yeah. Uh, I think we got really lucky with the venue. And they have this great basement, and the, the, the shape of the room is just perfect for comedy. It's just low ceilings, everything compressed, fits 50 to 70 people, and everything is focused towards the stage. It's very we strange. have like these stupid vegetable lights hanging up in the background. Uh... We have this, the music on the, we have the same, we bought the same shitty, I don't know if it's Yamaha or Casio um, keyboard. Yeah, it's just all the little bells and whistles around the experience. And then we try to book quality acts or we try to have a mix of, you know, a, a diverse but quality show. And we try not to have it be too long. And I try not to make it. Oh, yeah, we're going to do some stuff. Okay. <laughs> Anyways, ladies and gentlemen, it's been 10 minutes of me yelling at you. It's now time to start the show. Are you ready to start the show? <laughs> yes! Some of the finest comedians that Berlin has to offer. <laughs> no, they're not. And I, you can just feel that something is happening here. It's growing so fast, you know. And I remember talking to comedians last year about the scene and how excited I was, and then how something special was happening. And they were all very like, you know, they they don't believe in it anymore. They just like would smirk and be like, it's, it's funny that you still think that something could happen here in Berlin. Because they've been doing it for five, six years here with no real success. But I think it started kind of like about a year ago when it really blew up. And now there's there's so many open mics now, which I thought was problematic. But what happens now is you can double up every night too. Because there's too many shows, not enough comedians. So if you're a decent comedian, multiple shows will want you that night. So it's more stage time than ever. It's, it's growing in the best way possible. For you, let's just talk about you. For you to progress as much as you progressed in a, a year and a half, right? That could have taken you five years in the UK, you know? Would you have had that privilege to like find your voice so quick? Um, probably not, probably not. So, you know, it's a real privilege to perform on, on the scene here. I was doing jokes in London about, oh, I'm starting comedian and I live in Germany and Germans don't have sense of humor, blah, blah, hack, hack. And uh, everyone that was like at that mic where I was saying that came up to me afterwards and said, dude, there's a massive scene in Berlin, just moved to Berlin. And I'd enjoyed the whole experience so much that I went back and said to my wife, um, look, I need to do this, I need to move to Berlin. And she said, yeah, you should do that. And I said, ah, okay, this is over, isn't it? <laughs> Funny, but is he okay? I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm always fine. Stand up. Even when it's bad, it feels good. It feels good. Like I could have a terrible set. I could bomb my ass off for an hour straight and be on the bus on the way home and still know without a doubt that I would not rather have done anything else with my night. You know, I see people trying to do certain things with comedy and not asking themselves, why am I doing comedy? 
which is a very young thing to do, I guess. It's like you're going with your drive. It's like when it's like that's why you're bad at sex when you're young. You're like, I just want to put that thing in there, and you're like, yeah, yeah, I'm gonna do that. But you're not like in, you're not, you don't, you know, you can't really enjoy it. You're not. You don't understand what this is. You don't understand the intimacy of it. You don't know what you're doing to this other person. Just, I think people don't sit down with themselves, even the most simple, simple idea of sitting down with yourself and asking yourself, why do I do this? And not do this like once, do it like every month, every two months, like have a checkpoint with yourself and ask, what is the, what, what is it about this thing? And I think that it makes you better. It makes you a better comedian. Skateboarding makes me happy because like you do an ollie and it's like shitty in the beginning and then you try and do it better and you try and do it better and you're like okay I have like a understanding of how ollie works for example and then you're like I'm gonna try kickflip and it doesn't work for shit because you have to flip the board it makes no sense in your head and you keep trying and you keep trying and you keep trying and then one boop wow works and you're like that, you know, ah, oh, that's the, this is what it has to be, you know? And then you keep trying and you keep doing it and then sooner or later, kickflip is like easy as fuck. You know, you can kickflip downstairs, you can jump gaps, you can jump in, flip into grinds, you know? Cause that's, e the kickflip is easy for you now. Skateboarding is the same, you get astonished by it. It's not connected to your feet, how do you fly? You know, same thing with comedy, it's like, and that's what, this is, this is the beauty of comedy, that skateboarding, you need a lot of physical stuff. You need to jump, you need to hurt yourself, you know. Comedy doesn't hurt. Ego, maybe, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but, but like, in all reality, you could just go out there and just try. Classic. No. <laughs> I tell, no, I'm not French, I'm just bringing up the next comedian. <laughs> I had a corporate job for four months, and they paid me out of the ass, and I was still miserable. And I knew that's not what I wanted to do. I couldn't actually put all my time and effort into it because I knew I didn't want to be there the next week. <laughs> I never wanted to do that job again. You know, and I didn't want to be my boss one day. <laughs> no way. You know, but if I open for a comedian that I really admire, that's, wow, you're, around, you're surrounded by people that you respect. And that's another huge component of it. Yeah. Even if you suck, I respect you for being at an open mic and trying. At this point where I started, I was having like 10 panic attacks a day. I was just losing my mind a little bit. Um, and now, yeah, I mean, I, I feel fulfilled. I feel like I'm not wasting my time ever. And I, I, I know that what I'm doing is actually something that I want to do. And that's something that I think most people don't feel like they have. Fucking save my ass, comedy. I think I would be like very depressed or suicidal if I didn't have comedy in my life. Hi, mom. I did, I did Brendan's show earlier and, and I thought to myself, fucking great, there's no way that tonight can get any worse. I definitely wanted to do it at least as a serious hobby. And no, actually, I mean, I think it's safe to say I, I went into it wanting to do it as a job. Yeah, because I was at rock bottom. I was working in a, like a printing company and it was just draining the life out of me. And every day I was thinking, God, what am I doing here? I, I have to find something that means something to me. Straight away, it was like, like the first experience with it. It was just like, oh, wow, this is what I have to do. Like the rush I'd felt, I'm, it's quite, I'm, I'm a drug enthusiast, as many know. And this was the end of Dane's career. <laughs> and, the, and there's just no rush, like being on stage. Um, it's like, it was, it was a high that I hadn't experienced before. It was a mixture of everything that I had wanted to do my whole life. I always, as a kid, wanted to be a writer and an actor. And, you know, I love being on stage and... Uh, love having control, you know, and stand-up just gives you all of that. And it, to a small extent, it kind of reminded me of what home is like, because I grew up in like a big family with lots of cousins, lots of brothers, lots of sisters. And that was just basic, like a comedian's table, because there were, there were constant roasts and jokes all the time. If you wanted to talk, if you wanted people to hear what you had to say, you had to be funny. And I kind of...
Where would I like to go with this comedy thing? Well, since I, I feel like I have a responsibility, man, so I, I, I want I would look, I would really like to make a change. To be honest, I want to change people's opinion of Black Americans. I want to change people's opinion of uh, those coming from the Middle East, because I mean, you know, right now the world sees the guys, a lot of the guys as terrorists, you know, and I think that's that's horrible because not everybody falls into that category just because you're from a particular region. And I've been blessed to survive an environment where some of the terrorists actually exist. But being inside there and surviving, I actually got a chance to meet the other people that are there as well, the ones who are very hospitable, uh, uh, <laughs> hospitable <laughs> and very loving. And so I think the world needs to know that, man. Just from the environment that I'm in, like I I've seen so much stuff growing up, dog. Just been involved in so many situations. I went from a war zone to a war zone. You see what I'm saying? So for me, it's like to get on stage and laugh and to have people laugh along with me, it makes me forget about everything else. You see what I'm saying? Because like I never went through the whole process of uh, like desensitizing myself or whatever it's called. You know, when you get back from war, they ask you if you need like um, <clears throat> when you get back, they say, do you need do you want to talk to somebody? But I'm like, shoot, man, I'm good. Like back home, dude. Put it like this. When I compare Philadelphia to Iraq, Iraq was the most comfortable I've ever been. Or I didn't realize until like later on that that I actually had PTSD, that there was something like, that it wasn't normal to walk up the street and just be ready to fight at any moment. And so for me, comedy is the, it's the pacifier, man. It just brings me down, it just keeps me laughing and keeps me in a good mood and keeps everything flowing, yeah. The things that that always made me stick out on stage um, is the fact that I can take the weirdest, hardest, and nasty situation and find the funny, and I just relied on that when I went on stage. My life was very rough, but I always found the humor in it, and that's what I did on stage. You know, without even knowing what a premise, a setup, a punchline was, I just talked about things that I knew, and um, it landed because people can identify with what I talk about. I don't do, I don't pull comedy out of my ass. I pull comedy out of my life. Uh, everyone, they're, they're still blaming him, everyone. <laughs> so, so, like, yeah. But, but you look like you need to be on it, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Just joking, man. Come on, dude. Look, posture, oh, saved me. Come on. Saved me. Stand up saved me. And I'm, on, and I'm not, even, not even kidding you. Like, I'm, I'll get emotional talking about it because Berlin is a cesspool. And uh, when you're going through difficult, vulnerable times, and if you don't have a good support system, there are things here which can drag you down into a fucking hole. That's what it tells you that how meaningful uh, a pursuit that is. Because if it can help you something that difficult, then it means it's worth doing. I will walk to gigs, I'll cry on the way. And I'll do well on stage and I'll feel way better. And I walk back home and it'll give me enough to like, yeah, I'm going to sleep now. I'm okay. And uh, no, no, stand up, it helped. And I think it gave meaning because it was after a long time I was attached to something that I found meaningful. And it was way more meaningful to me, even my old relationship. Um, well, how do I manage being a single mom and being a stand-up comedian? Um, not easy. The first five years were easy because she didn't have to go to school, so she was on my back. I was on stage three weeks after birth, um, and I just strapped her to my back and did what I had to do. Everybody kept telling me, you can't do this, but I was like, no, you can't do this. I didn't have the luxury of having an option, and this was what I wanted to do, and this was what I did best. So it was like, she came into my life, I didn't come into her, so she had to just fucking go along with the goddamn ride. I didn't ask her permission. Um, when school started, life got really hard because I had to find a sitter and everything like that. I've sadly had weeks where I was gone for seven days. My daughter was with six different people. Um, that really, you know, hurt. Um, I've slept in the, the Köln Hauptbahnhof with my daughter. I've slept on the bridges. Um, we've gone to gigs where I only had enough money to get there. had no way how I was going to get back or where I was going to sleep. Um, and I, I don't regret it. You know, um, my daughter is now for that a very strong, well-balanced, open-minded young lady. Um, I am her constant, you know, and 
I don't want to keep doing it. You know what I'm saying? I'm ready for my career to get to a point where, you know, it's like, okay, I can relax a little bit. Nobody's really thinking about these things. Like, not a lot of people are really thinking about this. They may have one thing down. I want to make money and this is the way I'm going to make money. You're like, well, that's really not the way to make money. Because you have to look at all five elements and, and or four or five elements and then maybe get kind of an idea of where later you can get money. But if money is the thing driving you or fame is the thing, fame is the worst thing that can drive a person. Like, if you want fame, that's a good, let's say it's a good motivation, but that means you don't really understand yourself. Like, why would you want fame? What is, what, what is that, where does that come from? And, and if, like, if that's a driving force for you, maybe you should understand what that is. Fame is, is a bitch. Like, it can ruin you the same way it can do good to you, right? So, a lot of people don't think about that. They don't think about the aspects of different things. Uh, and I think that makes them weaker when they, when they approach a creative process. At the end of the day, the art is the thing. And if you don't treat the art as the thing, then you're gonna, you, like, there's people I've seen that burst into success and then they go away because they didn't develop anything. If you have a product that just looks good and you sell it, 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 at a certain point people go, all right, we've got the product, what's next? And you're like, I don't know, and then you're gone. Yeah, 13 years. You know, 13 years, I'm, I'm at it. You know, um, it was a slow process. I know comedians who did it overnight. Very glad my career was not that. It was hard as hell. But it's like building a house. If you start at the, with the roof, the house is not very stable. You know, my, my career started with the foundation. I had to build from the basement up. Every screw, every beam, everything. You know, and I feel with this, Yes, I wanted it to go fast. No, not really. You know, sure, there were days where I felt like, oh my God, I wanted to go a little bit faster and everything like that. I can't, I can't lie. But now I feel like it's so stable that the, 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 the more I get up there, the more I can't come back down. I, I had like a, uh, something happened in my life and I was like, uh, and that was a trigger on a personal level. And, uh, and then I started asking questions like, uh, okay, come on, you've been doing it for how long now? You've been in and out for four years. Either you do it or you quit it. The scene here is super friendly. Um, it's very laid back, but maybe a bit too laid back sometimes. Because when I was in LA, for example, you really get the sense that people are, they're concerned that this is kind of like a, a make or break thing for them. Like maybe they're really obsessed with being a comedian and they want it to be their career and they have hundreds of other people around them who are equally enthusiastic about it. Whereas in Berlin, I think we have some very talented people who get a lot of stage time, but um, there's not always that fire under your arse, of course, to, to kind of get better because there's no, at the moment, paying professional trajectory here if you stay in Berlin. I hope that I won't have to leave Berlin to do it because I feel like the Berlin scene is so young and it's expanding so rapidly that it could just become something amazing. And they could, like within the next sort of couple of years, uh, maybe that element of professionality or whatever it is that needs to come in is going to, to appear. Um, and the whole thing with this, this scene is that it's like, it's up to us. The performers, like where performers, producers, marketing, we're doing the marketing, you just go into a bar and say, can I do a show? And they go, yeah, <laughs> you know, you don't need any creds or anything. So it's almost like it's our responsibility to bring that, that sort of professional element into the scene and make it a place where you can make it. Well, I still think a lot like an older person in a relationship because I, you know, I'm thinking about pension and like I'm a bit farther along. I have older parents. I think about having to be able to support them and stuff like that. And uh, when you are living this very exciting life of being an artist, which is very rewarding, unlike anything I've ever done before, much better than my office job that I had for a long time. Um, it's still, you know, at the end of the day, you gotta you know, pay, pay them bills kind of thing, so. Uh, it's because I'm very vulnerable when I talk about my money. <laughs> <laughs> Right now, that's the next question. What's gonna happen with the day job? Everybody keeps asking the same question. Are you gonna quit? Are you gonna quit? Are you gonna do it professionally? And I'm like, what, what does it mean doing it professionally? Like, I'm doing it. Like, I'm, uh, it's 50% of my life right now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm taking 100% financial risk. There's no agent, there's no booker. I do all the booking myself. 
Uh, which is so far, because so far so well, I've done almost 85 shows this year, 85 one-hour shows, uh, and over like maybe like 60, 70 cities in Europe. Uh, and everything was self-produced, self-promoted, self-performed, self-ticketed at the door, you know. Uh, and it's, yeah, it's very stressful, I guess, because it's, a, but it's getting a lot easier now than it was at the start of the year, because you kind of figure out some of the mistakes, you know, I don't have to buy last minute plane flights because I fucked up the, oh, I didn't realize it would take me 16 hours to get by bus from this place to this other place, and I got a show tomorrow. So I've kind of uh, set up the stuff better, but, uh, and the shows are doing much better. Like I said, this past run has been like 70% sold out shows. And a lot of times the people, you know, there's a demand, people are hungry for comedy. They see it online, they see it on YouTube, they see it on Netflix, and there's no one doing it in that region, right? Because again, it's such a difficult thing to do without stage time. And you need to have a scene to get the stage time. You know, you can't just set up 25 shows in your city. If we try to replicate what London and New York and LA have done, we're going to fail. Absolutely, we're going to fail because those were set up in the era of TV. We are in the era of the internet. So we need to adapt to the way social media works and that is the angle, I mean, which, is, which is actually an advantage slightly, right? Because uh, then, because if, I mean, nobody in Hungary watches German TV unless they're German and they're very interested in watching German TV. Um, same thing in Scandinavian, same thing in, 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 in Italy. Right, but it's the EU and it's a single market, so there's a lot of freedom of movement and this and this and that. So you can take advantage of that and go on the internet and, and find those pockets of people who are actually interested in English stand up. And then you can build maybe a life doing touring. And then that is where you can make a, a living touring. But that is a bitch, too. <laughs> <laughs> that is also another, that's another kind of worms, but that is a way in which you can go. You can make money touring. To live on the road, for example. I'm not sure that's something that I want to do. Um, so often I think about that, if I work harder at it, get better, make more money at it, get in a position where I could tour more, it would be very rewarding, but it's also a lifestyle I think you have to be kind of mentally prepared for. It's just the, phys the physicality of having to do it. That's the, I, I didn't know how much traveling could put strain on your, on your body physically. like. We did the first tour, and it was not even a big tour. We, we did four cities. When we came back to Berlin, four cities in a week. I came back to Berlin, I was dead. Physically, like, I was emotionally drained. I was just physically tired. I couldn't, I couldn't master my legs. I was just like, what the fuck? Physically traveling from city to city, because you go to a city, you unpack your shit, you, you get into the Airbnb, you unpack your stuff, take a nap, right? Put the, the, the equipment, because we go with equipment, of course, put the equipment, go to the venue, unpack the equipment, set up the chairs, people come in, you check the tickets, blah, 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 the show starts, bang, 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 bang. You talk to the people after you've done the show, you go tear down the venue. Some venues help you out by tearing up and setting up, right? You, t you, you, either t you have to tear down your equipment, walk back to your Airbnb, sleep for three hours, back at the airport, get to another flight, fly to the other city, go to the Airbnb, repeat. It is insane. It puts it puts a lot of strain on you. It's a lot of physical strain on you. So it's yeah, that's the most difficult part of it is just the traveling part. Just keeping just keeping your mind together and hoping you don't break. The ecosystem isn't mature enough to support the acts yet, mm. right? Uh, yeah, because because I mean it's just the way I think about it. Yeah, it's just like it's not there in English. It's not yet there because you do you do stand up. You go on TV. People see who you are and then they come to your shows. That is how you reach out to the people. And in Berlin, we don't have that reach out. There's no upper, there's no upper upwards career mobility, right? There's no, there's no Comedy Central presents or in terms of comedy. There's no way to get, the, there's no way to break out of the scene, right? But yeah, I think the, the key to make money right now is just producing shows, really. Unfortunately, it's not just the performing, but like being able to like, do shows, I feel like there's, if you're really good at promoting, you could actually make a living a lot more than if you're a really good comedian, in Berlin at least, you know? When people get into comedy, a lot of them don't think about the promotion side. So they think about the expression and the freedom and the, 
um, the art of the whole thing. That's what they focus on. But if you want to make a show a success, like you have to do a hell of a lot of promotion. Uh, it took a lot of time because I j just wanted to do it perfectly. So I was like uh, flyering, like going myself and flyering for the show. Uh, Facebook ads weren't even a thing back then. So uh, it was meetup, websites, everything. So it would take a lot of time. And also I was doing the shows that I was producing. Both of them were at alternative places. So um, it's like very communal. So you have to do it yourself. So I had to set up the whole room and take care of the tech and even buy the tech. And and I wasn't making money out of it. But uh, I think it was uh, I think it was one of the for Doiglish was one of the projects that I'm mostly proud of because it was very my little baby and it grew. It like became too popular. I guess one thing I often think about is what can I do and still be authentic, as corny as that is, but. Uh, I've had a lot of, I've had opportunities of it all, have, I've had offers to do things comedy wise where I might have gotten paid more money but they just didn't feel like why I got into this in the first place. And that's I think the issue with a lot of social media stuff too, like I see people putting stuff out there but I'm like is that really what they, is that what they're, is that still entertainment for them or is it still because is it, can they, they kind of realize that's the game they have to jump into and they have to generate this stuff in order for, um, in order to be able to make a bit of money. At it. I stopped it. I couldn't. Just it was, uh, it was too much work and uh, I had a feeling it was taking me away from something else and I, I needed to let it go. Okay. <laughs> it's been very stressful. I started my own show and the first night was interesting because I was just, I'm very optimistic. I just thought, you know, first show, friends are going to show up. It's going to be okay even even if it's just my friends there. Um, but a lot of them didn't show up or couldn't show up. And um, people were coming in very late. We the, the format of the show was that we had a 9 p.m. show and an 11 p.m. show, something that doesn't really exist in the Berlin scene. And that way people could double up more because now that there's so many shows, we wanted to <clears throat> also use the fact that people were probably going to double up as a reason for why they should pick our show. So I think, and then the problem with the audience for the second show was arriving in the middle of the first show because the first show started so late because, uh, because uh, I guess, I don't know why, yeah, because not enough people were there. So... It was kind of chaos. You didn't know when people were coming in, when people were leaving, which show we were on, really. It was more like a show with uh, four quarters than anything. Uh, and uh, it was very stressful. Just you didn't know when people were actually going to show up. Um, we made practically no donations. I mean, we made about 15 bucks in donations, which is nothing, really. Um, and... Yeah, and I just didn't know. I didn't want to disappoint everyone who signed up for the second show and was coming from a different venue and all these people that were showing up. But essentially what then happened was it was beautiful. It was just the funnest show I've had in a long time in Berlin, which ironically was a lot like a New York open mic. It was mostly in front of other comedians. I think there was still three audience members sitting there, the three best audience members who had so much fun that they wanted to stay. Um, we all went up and we, the, me and my co-host, we kind of forced everyone to do new material only. Um, you know, push the envelope a little bit and people were killing it. It was great. It was a, it was a good time. <laughs> Thank you so much for sticking around, you guys. <laughs> this has been way... What? <laughs> what? Uh, <laughs> Did he touch the window? Uh, no. Okay. Oh, you could also start like going like back and forth a bit with the cards or help him if he was touching the window. You know, like... Ah, din, 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 din. I'm a very altruistic person. <laughs> no, because when I saw... I'm hosting, I have no idea what I'm doing because, again, I'm not a sociable person. When I talk to people, I by accident can say something which comes off as something too rude, too obnoxious or too intrusive if in real life. On stage, I kind of try to make it a, a bit, 
you know, but uh, I'm not a likable person. I don't think I'm a likable person. So I'm trying. I'm very surprised every time. Sometimes it works and I'm like, oh, wow, it worked. So, uh, and sometimes I do my material there because I don't know what to do sometimes. I go, okay, so, 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 so. I talk to this person, talk to this person. I don't feel the connection. Maybe I can elaborate my material, kind of like incorporate my material. Jesus! So I saw in a trailer of this man who took his dick out and he kept eye contact. I was looking at him, but I was looking at his eyes and he wasn't doing the, like, the motion, he was doing the money counting motion like that. And he was looking at me going, Lee bling, Lee bling. And I found it very insulting because he couldn't it up. I'm like, if you're doing this, try harder, you know? But again, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So when you're doing crowd work, it's not a good chance. Uh, some people go, oh, it's a great way to polish your material. It's more stage time. For me, it's not. It's a completely different kind of stage time. You become good at talking shit to random people and keeping them kind of like, hoo, hoo, hoo. Uh, but it's not time to polish your material because I present it completely differently, I think, when I'm just doing material. It's completely different Lena, it's completely different energy I need to give out, it's completely different level of confidence. Yeah, I kind of burned out last year because I was hosting or warming up four shows a week. And when you're doing that, you're not writing new material, you're not trying out any new jokes, and the joy of comedy for me is coming up with new ideas and trying them out. And if you're just hosting, you're, you you have that hosting energy, like, hey guys, all right. And you're just doing your jokes that always work for hosting, which is what you're supposed to do, but it's not fun if you want to be developing material. Think doing new material while hosting works at all? Uh, even bits don't really work sometimes. Uh, I think the host is there to make a smooth, smooth flow of the show. Uh, not to attack the audience, which I tended to do. Uh, I tend to do, uh, like to be bitchy. Uh, so be friends with them, make them on your side because you're the one person they're gonna keep seeing in between acts. So if you suck or if you they don't like you, then they won't stay, you know? So uh, you're the same, like if, uh, if they don't like an act, they're like, oh, okay, the host is coming back. I think that I have to make them have a good time. They are there for good time. If they don't have this good time, it's my fault. I'm the host of the show. It means that I'm in kind of I'm responsible for their happiness. I'm responsible for comedians enjoying their time when they're on stage. So if I'm not providing that, that I'm a piece of shit. I think the only times that I'm present is when I am eating, when I'm fucking or masturbating, or when I'm on stage. Those are the only times that I'm present. <laughs> Everywhere else in life, I'm just like, I have a song in my head that I'm saying, I'm recapping a Simpsons episode from like 27 years ago. Whatever it is, man, I'm not, I'm not present, I'm not there. When I am hosting, I am the most present. I am there all the time. I'm good at crowd work, I'm good at reacting to things. I'm witty, I, I'm, I'm, I, can, I can react to things. But I, I, I like the idea of the, the hosting should be no, no prep material really. You can do a one or two jokes for me. For my 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 taste. My everybody's got their own way of doing things. But like my way is just like I don't. I might do one or two bits in between if it needs it. If the show needs it, I will lift it up. I lift up the energy. Someone bombed. I do a joke that I know, I know will work to just lift it up. For the most part, I I'm, I'm a crowd work guy and just I I try to rock it, man. I try to do what what's yeah. I, I try to have that that room popping. The idea is to have everyone excited. And uh, I feel like if you're, it, an audience wants to see you in control, whoever the fuck you are on stage, not just the host, but any performer. If you're in control of that room, if a room, if, a, if an audience member comes in and just like, oh, he's got me, everything's gonna be fine. Everything's hey, gonna Bradley, be fine. ladies and gentlemen. I, I know the show wasn't a full success, but we're sure as shit. Can't end with Dane Brasher, ladies and gentlemen. This is not happening on my watch. Get your ass up here. Yeah, that's really like, that's like, it's like, it's dirty work, you know? And that's, I don't know, it's humbling. And reminds you that this is a, not only like an art form, but also like a job. <laughs> it's a decision I think a lot of people have to face too. Like, would you have to think, okay, would you want to move to London? Would you want to move to, to New York or LA, one of these places? 
And um, when I was in LA a couple weeks ago, I met up with a lady who was performing here. Uh, she comes to, to Berlin every once in a while and she's having a lot of good breaks there and it's going very well for her. Um, but the lifestyle in LA, like driving everywhere and you're performing at open mics where there are like 20 people on the, on the, in the running order every night and you're performing just for other comics and I guess that's, those are the steps you have to go through if you want to make it into a big commercial market. I started in Berlin, I think it was, it was 2013. I think it was August in 2013. So it was always in the back of my head. Um, uh, and then as things started progressing, I was like, okay, I should probably move to New York if I'm going to take this seriously. Uh, nobody knows you and nobody gives a shit about you. But that is, which is like the opposite of Berlin. Cause we were like, oh my God, new blood. Yeah. Come in, come join us. Let's do this. Let's do that. You know, you're like, you know, you almost make an effort to, um, incorporate people into the group cause you wanted to get bigger. Cause I'll start to shut, you know, it's just more opportunity. There's no such thing as an open mic here that is like a, uh, um, a Berlin open mic, uh, a Berlin open light mic, like even like the one that I ran um uh when i was there that would be considered a show that comics that on tv would die to get on starting here is just such a wonderful place to and i say starting like i was always planning on leaving but like i wasn't it was just more that like as soon as i realized that like i wanted to keep doing stand up instead of it just being like something i did while i was here i knew i was going to live in london again at some point um like looking outside of it like it's such a better place to start here because there isn't the obsessive like career side to it. Like people who are starting here, you're not gonna make a career out of it unless you make it yourself. Whereas in like London or like LA or New York, I think when you start, you're aware of agents and like not everyone, but in general, like you're aware of agents and um, the shows that are progression shows. Whereas here you just do all the mics and then you get to the showcase once a year. And then you can do a split hour with your friend and then you just put it on yourself. And, but you're not, no agents are coming, no producers are coming, no one's coming to pick you up and whisk you away. Like it is just, you're just performing to the people that saw you at the mics that week and a couple of people that are hit up on Facebook who like free comedy. Like that's it. And there's something really nice about that because the competitive element of anything in the arts goes when the industry is removed. I've spent the last couple of years building this this now hour of of material that I don't I feel like like I'm proud of it. I'm proud of this thing that I made and it's a cohesive piece of work and I'd like to just polish it and make it perfect and then eventually tape it and, and put it up and, and just get people to see it. Another side of it, which is your first hour, which has just become this like massive obsessive thing for a lot of comics, which is your first hour, you're a debut act. I even struggle with the idea of kind of doing a special because you're like, um, why would I frame anything that's an hour? I get it as a movie. I don't get it yet as a comedian. I do get it when I look at the great comedians, because the great comedians, like, I think Dave Chappelle as well, you have him here on your wall, like, he just goes out and riffs for three, four hours. He's exploring, this is what I think of what he's doing, I'm, I'm, I don't know, but I'm just thinking, he's exploring ideas, he's exploring themes, he, he, he's, he's trying to figure out what he finds interesting, and then he creates something out of it. And I guess that when you get to that level and you kind of realize, huh, I want to, I have a message here, I want to do, I want to say something, then you package that in an hour. And all, then it also makes a lot of sense to just let it go. Because it's not important. You've already said what you, what you said. You know, like you can't hold on to that. Uh, if you think about like, uh, you know, um, older filmmakers, right? Think about uh, uh, um, Scorsese, for example. Yeah, he did uh, Raging Bull. He did all these kind of great movies. But he, he's, he's not doing them now. That's done. So he can't just live that. He has to let that go. And I think the same thing with comics. You did the hour, it's gone. So that's what you thought at this moment and you f thought this was relevant. And you are so good at your craft that, that you managed to say what you meant at that moment, 
which I think is is probably the one of the most difficult things to do for a comedian. No circle jerk, no sucking your dick or nothing like that, but out of uh, the entire scene, you are in definitely the top five of people who, the, when you started, to where you are now. That's the fucking uh, duality of an artist, you know what I mean? It's like, and this is what so many artists, they, they, they kind of self kind of describe themselves as being bipolar. And you're like, no, no, you're not bipolar, right? You're just an artist, right? You're just a performer and this is, you know, Every, I've worked in pretty much every field of art, it seems, right, you know what I mean? And, um, and in each of them, I've had my moments of fucking, I'm so good at this, and then an hour later, really doubting myself. But you gotta have that doubt. If you don't have that doubt, man, you're like, that's when you get really deluded, I think. Uh, but then the problem also is sometimes for artists, they've got too much doubt which then doesn't allow, doesn't give them that confidence to go, fucking no, you know what I mean? I'm good enough to do this, I'm good. It would be nice you know, to be able to actually give all of my time and energy to this thing that I love so much, would be nice. But we'll do this last show in Berlin see how it goes, put out the special next year, see how that goes. And hopefully at the end of all this, when the smoke clears, I might have a career. Eins, zwei, drei, quattro. Is you is, or is you ain't my baby? Telling everybody you say me Is you is or is you ain't my baby Walk around town telling everybody you say me Telling everybody you see me, see me, see me.